1932 is mostly nothing here. The Merry Melodies carry on using one-way characters in their music-centered shorts, since unlike Bosco in the Looney Tunes, Roxy, Moxie and Piggy were just too shameless of a copycats of Mickey Mouse, which does explain why they didn't last that long. Nevertheless, they came up with another new character, Goopy Gear, a biped dog with a white mask who looks reminiscent of another Disney character, a black-masked anthropomorphic dog, also created in 1932. Even their first names are similar, another unquestionable proof of how much Warner enjoys mimicking Disney, since Goopy Gear was released on April 16th, whereas Mickey's review... Oh. Anyway, there's nothing else to address, these shorts are quite unremarkable and dated, even though it's got to me again, got to be nominated for the Academy Award for the best short category, in which it eventually lost against Burt Gillis' Flowers and Trees. Not just an ordinary short. As for the Looney Tunes, they are still Bosco territory, in gradually more elaborate stories more focused on gags than on dance numbers, which isn't exactly an exclusive since they're yet to be retired for good. Moreover, there's a little bit more structure than in the Merry Melodies shorts, and there may still be room for gags, like in Battling Bosco or the crafty ending of Riding Bosco, panning out to show Herman, Ising and Norm Blackburn watching the cartoon and making sound effects. Such a combo between animation and real-life footages is what convinced Schlesinger to make a run in the industry to begin with. After all, the pilot cartoon at Bosco and Dising his own creator interacting to each other. On to the animation front, we got some new important names, like the McKimson brothers, who began as assistants of two absolute legends in the industry. Thomas, the other brother, for Norm Ferguson, and Robert for Dick Lundy. So more Disney rookies. In the year prior, Schlesinger had hired an eager youngster as a mere assistant upon being impressed by his films, and his full name was Robert Emerson Clampett. Nonetheless, something undeniably had to change. Why was Flowers and Trees awarded by the Academy? For being a Disney product? Yes, it would sound like the most logical answer, but it's more like for being in Technicolor, an innovation for the time and nearly inconceivable in 1932. Maybe it's merely my opinion, but Warner's initial defeat quite bothered Orman for curing by the wise hands of that very studio, enduring an overwhelming return to reality, because in their current state there is absolutely no way they could compete with Silly Symphonies at Disney in general, which would monopolize the Academy Award category for the rest of the decade. Three Little Pigs, The Tortoise and the Hare, The Country Cousin, The Ugly Duckling, all Academy Award raw material. As a result, upon releasing over 50 shorts, their output still felt quite obsolete in comparison. Therefore, 1933 had to feature important events. And it had. Such as the economic disagreements between Herman's increasing ego and Schlesinger money thirst, leading to the former leaving Warner Studios for good, alongside Ising and his own creation, Bosco, since he factually owned the rights of his own character. The Kansas City duo's final shorts, Bosco's Picture Show and Wearing the Money, both released on August 26th, represent the very end of the first era for Warner Brothers, as Armand's short would be the final appearance of Bosco in a Warner medium and Dising's short the last of Frank Marseille's as a composer for Warner. 1933 also features the promotion of one of the animators of Armand and Dising unit. Making his debut as a director in Bosco in Dutch, alongside Herman, his name was Isidor Fritz Freeling. Judging from this cartoon and Bosco in person, something sure is different. How is it possible? They seem like ordinary slow-paced music-centered shorts, yet dance choreographies feel more polished and refined, and music sort of follows Bosco's actions. Sure enough, blending audio and visuals together would eventually become the main quirk of Freeling's not-so-short-lived career. As for Harmon and Dising, they would soon be hired by MGM and found their Technicolor series The Happy Harmonies, featuring their very creation Bosco. But in the end of the day, what is Bosco in actuality? If Mickey Mouse is a rat and Felix the Cat is a feline, what is Bosco supposed to be, considering he was meant to replicate Mickey's design plus the human ears? Well, 
he's essentially an African-American stereotype, and as we all know by now, media didn't used to really detach minorities from ancestral cliches in the 30s and 40s, often portraying them through black faces, mammy and the dice gag. Although, Basco wasn't really an offensive depiction, as his character role didn't quite rely on his countenance to provide some humor. In the meantime, Schlesinger started to produce his own cartoons at Warner's, but upon Harmon and Dising dissolution, he had to start all over again, with a new staff and a new mascot. So he hired Bernard Brown and Norman Spencer as the new composers, and former Disney animator Tom Palmer as a supervisor of the new series around Basco's substitute, a white boy named Buddy, and his girlfriend Cookie. Pfft, <laughs> Cookie. <laughs> Officially debuting in Buddy's Day Out, which bumped a ton. Can you imagine how much time this short took to introduce the whole cast? Two minutes. The fact Palmer was a competent animator doesn't necessarily imply he's a capable director, which unfortunately is not. This is a dreadful cartoon, featuring tasteless characters in random, saccharine situations, lacking amalgamation and substance, comedy is non-existent, timing is laughable, and worst of all, there is no soul. As flawed as the Bosco series was, at least he tried to give some memories. Buddy sucks so much he makes us miss Bosco, despite all of his flaws. Palmer's second and last short is a Mary Meldis short, I've Got to Sing a Torch Song, which is the same old terribly trite dunghill filled with music skits that made Schlesinger quickly realize Palmer's massive gaps, therefore he had to replace him with Earl Duval, whose output isn't particularly memorable but definitely offers something more compared to Palmer. Though the animation credits inevitably catch our interest, as not only we got further important names like Jack King, Don Williams and Tish Tash, aka Frank Tashlin, but also former members of the harmonizing era getting rehired, like Bob Clampett, Bob McKimson and Fritz Freeling, ready to overcome the lethargic buddy era in the following years.